This is the second of three parts that I'm delivering at a day school on communist economics in Brussels later this month. This is a preliminary run through of the uh, lecture for video purposes that I'm making available on YouTube. What I'm talking about here is an idea that was fundamental, I believe, to Marx, which was that the communist economy has to go beyond being a monetary economy. This became a lively topic of debate in economics at the early part of the 20th century. A key role in this was played by the Austrian socialist economist Neurath, who immediately after the First World War advocated that a socialist economy could learn from the way war economy was run and that it would use calculations in kind, not calculations in money. Planning, he said, should be done in physical terms, not in terms of money. He had been involved with the war planning ministry in Germany during the First World War. And during the war it had become evident that to survive, states had to plan and prioritise physical production of key raw materials, of labour, foodstuffs, etc. And he proposed that this experience could be a model for socialist planning in the future. The immediate response of this by other right-wing Austrian economists was to say that non-market calculation was impossible. The two leading figures who come down to this day as the icons of the Austrian school were von Mises and Hayek. Von Mises went to bat against um, Neurath first by saying that only money provided a rational basis for comparing cost. If you have to choose between different techniques of production how do you decide which is the most efficient? Any technique of production involves combining multiple incompatible use values. You can only say which is the cheapest and therefore the best if you can convert these into some common unit of account. He conceded that in principle Marx's idea of using labour time provided a common unit of account but he denied that it was practical because he said that in order to derive what the labour value of commodities were you'd have to solve millions of equations which was impractical. Hayek entered the debate later in the 1930s and his key additions to the problem were to claim that the market acted like a telecommunication system, a system of passing information around, and that it was only the market that could possibly solve the problem of dispersed information, which was not concentratable in any one place. Now, back in the 1930s, this was responded to, most prominently by Oscar Langer, who showed that it was in fact principle possible to do these calculations but Langer's response was within the framework of neoclassical economics. Langer turned neoclassical economics against the bourgeoisie by showing that even neoclassical theory could be used to argue for socialism. He did not attempt to defend either the labour theory of value or Neurath's calculation in kind approach. Now, one of the points that von Mises had, had, had raised was that although you could use labour values in principle, practically it was impossible because of the sheer scale of the number of products you had to deal with in a modern economy. Obviously at the same time as this was going on as a theoretical debate 
in the 1930s. At a practical level, the USSR was solving the problem by what it called the system of material balances. By the 1950s, they were able to prepare detailed material balances for some 3,000 products and had some control over a further 30,000 products. Uh, I get that from the development of econo socialist economic thought by Dobb. But by the late 60s, there were several million distinct products in the Soviet economy. And the Gosplan staff amounted to a few thousand people, three or four thousand people. It just was not practical to apply the system of material balances to such a large number of different products. To give an impression of the scale of this, let's just assume one million products. Now, if you represent this as a standard input-output matrix, you'll have a matrix that's a million by a million. If we represent all fields as 32-bit floating-point numbers, that's clearly going to involve uh, of the order of 4 terabytes of store, which was way beyond what was practical with uh, Soviet computers. You can, however, represent the information more compactly. Suppose we represented it as a, a list of pairs comprised of a product code and the amount of input required to produce it. So each production process is a list of pairs and each pair identifies a product code or an amount of input. And we would then say each pair would take two full words of computer memory. If there are 200 products on average required for each output, 200 products going in to produce each output, then you'd require about 400 million words of memory to do the planning, say one and a half gigabytes. Well, that looks practical nowadays, but even that was rather large by the standards of what the, the Soviet Union had available. Ideally, you'd have wanted at least 1.5 gigabytes of fast RAM, but at a pinch you could have used hard disks. Now let's look at what was available in the 1970s. By 1975, CDC in America was building 300 megabyte drives, but these were embargoed to the USSR. In addition, if you're going to do the base calculations on the... Uh, sorry, if you're going to do the calculations using disks, you're going to need some fast RAM as a cache. You're going to need of the order of a million words of RAM. The best US technology didn't reach this level until 1975 with the Cray-1. So I'm showing, I'll give you a picture of these. Four of these drives could have been held the information required to compute a million labor values. Um, what I'm saying is that the goals Marx had set for communism were not yet possible in the 1960s. Remember what he, his goals were. You weren't going to have any money, calculation was going to be in labour times and use values, and payment was going to be in terms of labour credits. But to work out the labour content of every good required the solution of millions of equations which you just couldn't do in the 1960s. So as a result, Soviet socialism still needed money for economic calculation even in the planned sector. It was not possible for a production engineer in a Soviet factory to work out the cheapest method of calculation except by adding up the ruble cost of two different ways of doing it. Secondly, since they were only tracking around 30,000 products, they had to set targets for factories in monetary terms. They couldn't go right down to the individual product codes and say exactly how many of those were going to be required. This meant that aggregate uh, plans were ex expressed in monetary units and you constantly had the problem of 
individual factories gaming the system to try and produce that mix of goods which would meet their monetary targets but were not necessarily what in physical terms were required by their national plan. So there was an inability to handle disaggregate plans at the all union level. Beyond this money was still used for wage payments. But that meant you had cash, you had black markets, corruption and a constant pressure to restore capitalist relations because the criteria of success came to be defined in terms of monetary cost accounting. There's a second issue which is one of computational complexity beyond the question of could you simply store in a computer the information required this is a question how easy is it to solve millions of equations there are some problems which become computationally intractable even for the largest computers and it has been suggested that economic planning or the use of labor values is something like that I think we've been able to show fairly well that this isn't the case. In a series of papers Alan Cottrell, Greg Michelson and I have shown that the computational complexity of computing labour values for an entire economy with n products grows as n log n which is one of the nicest tractability classes you can get for an algorithm. So it's easily solved by modern computers. The, the workload does not rise at an uh, unmanageably fast rate as you add products. In Towards a New Socialism we set out certain essential principles of cyber communism. One of them is that actual control over what is produced has to be done democratically. Now this can only be done on major decisions. You can't have the whole population deciding how much of every individual product is going to be produced. But it is possible to decide how much labour is going to be devoted to education, health, pensions, sick care, etc. How much labour is going to be devoted to environmental protection. How much is going for national defence and how much for national for new investment. Uh, all of this can principle be done by direct voting using computers or mobile phones. At Glasgow University we prototype software to aggregate the wishes of the public this way and have come up with algorithms to do it. If you Google for handy vote you'll come across the system that we developed at Glasgow University for it. It is released in open source but it probably requires a fair bit of expertise for someone to tailor it uh, practically to use it because it was developed by a series of student projects. The second part of uh, the cyber communism is a labor time economy. Marxist principle that non-public goods are delivered by the equivalence principle. You get back in goods the same amount of labor after tax that you perform. Hence goods are priced in labor hours and you need a cybernetic feedback from what is actually being sold to the planners to adjust output to meet consumer needs. Since the 1960s a series of key developments have occurred in the productive forces. Firstly the internet, secondly giant databases, thirdly supercomputers and fourth electronic payment systems. The internet allows real-time cybernetic planning and can solve the problem of dispersed information which was Hayek's key objection. Big data allows the confirmation, the, the concentration of the large amounts of information needed for planning. Obviously behind big data there is the underlying development of storage technologies. In particular the development of high-speed solid-state, non-moving head 
stores. Supercomputers can solve millions of equations in seconds, removing von Mises' objection, and electronic payment cards allow the replacement of paper cash, which is always usable in black markets, with non-transferable labour credits. According to Marx, the key feature of labour credits was that labour accounts is that they don't circulate. If you use labour notes, you still have that problem. So this is the, the schema that we put forward in TNS. You have production taking place, goods are sold in public shops, the managers of the shops are instructed to sell them at such prices as will ensure that the market clears. All this is recorded at the point of sale terminals. The ratio of prices to labour values for all goods is then computed. If the goods are selling at above their labour value, clearly society wants to allocate more labour to that branch of production. If they're selling below their labour value, society wants to allocate less to its production. The planners then adjust the final targets. These are the final output targets. They then do the material balances to, to derive the gross output uh, requirements. They compare these with the actual resources available, some of which may be set by environmental constraints, and see whether the final output targets can be met. If not, the final output targets are adjusted until they can be met with the available resources and the environmental constraints that have been chosen. From this, a detailed production plan is formed, which is broadcast over the internet to all the individual state factories. Marx conceived of time as having a, a dual role. Speaking of communism, he wrote, labour time would in that case play a double part. Its apportionment in accordance with a definite social plan maintains the proper proportions between the different kinds of work to be done and the various wants of the community. On the other hand, it also serves as a measure of the portion of the common labour borne by each individual and of his share in the total product destined for individual consumption. The social relations of the individual producers with regard both to their labour and to its product are in this case perfectly simple, intelligible and, with that regard, not only to production but also to distribution. So he's saying labour time is used to plan production and it is used to allocate the product to the individuals and by doing it this way social relations are defetishized and become transparent. In the Critique of the Gotha program, he proposes that as a first simple model of communism, that people are credited with hours worked and that goods are marked in public warehouses with their time content. Yet in The Poverty of Philosophy, he had argued against Proudhon's proposal to have simple labour time pricing. Is there therefore a contradiction between what he'd been saying earlier on in his life and what he said later on? There are two distinctions, however, between what Marx was proposing in his later life and what he criticised Proudhon for. The first is that labour credits don't circulate as money, and the second is that production is directly social, carried out by the community rather than by petty private traders. This still leaves another objection that he made in The Poverty of Philosophy, that the social labour time the socially necessary amount of labour allocated to a branch of production depends on demand and that it needs the oscillation of prices around values. Suppose a shirt, and I'm showing appropriate 1970s shirts, takes an hour to make. Then it will be marked in the public stores at one hour. But if that style of shirt is no longer wanted, clearly they won't sell. 
the state shops may have to sell them at 30 minutes or even 10 minutes instead of 60 minutes. If goods are selling below their labour content, you then tell the planners to make less of them. If goods are selling above their labour content, tell the planners to make more of them. But these deviations from labour price of labour price from labour value are going to be temporary and they'll cancel out over time and across different goods. Now some people have raised the the issue of whether this is compatible with environmental constraints. Suppose we set a limit to the amount of carbon dioxide that's going to be produced by an industrial economy and let's assume we reduce it 2% a year. Does that not mean that goods that produce carbon dioxide will have to be sold at above their labour value? Well, that might be one way to do it, but the other way to look at it is to say that when drawing up a set of materially possible plans, the planning algorithm already has to deal with the fact that only certain techniques of production are known and only certain production resources are available. And when the planners compute labour times or labour values for commodities or for goods, they wouldn't be commodities, if they c compute the labour values for the commodities, for the goods, they have to only take into account those production techniques which are already known. There is no point trying to take into account production techniques which haven't been invented yet. Well, formally, if you declare that a certain method of production, one that releases a large amount of carbon dioxide, for instance, producing electricity by, from coal, is no longer allowed, you're in the same position as if it had never been discovered. There's lots of things which potentially could be discovered and aren't known about, but we don't allow these to enter into economic calculation. Essentially, what environmental constraints amount to is saying, forget about the old ways of producing things and compute the labour values on the basis of the new ways which are compatible with the environmental objectives. I'm going to go into some detail now to show how in a communist economy labour credits would not circulate it. Marx said they would be like theatre tickets and be cancelled out after use. You could not actually use bearer notes like these labour notes issued by the Owenites in Britain. They wouldn't work for communism, though they might be used in a socialist transition period. The problem is that they would still circulate and be used on the black market because they're physical objects which can be moved around. Marx speaks of certificates recording how many hours you've worked. He doesn't speak of notes. He wasn't an advocate of labour money. To prevent circulation, these certificates had to be tied to the particular person who did the work. How might this have been achieved, let us say, with 19th century technology, and then we'll go on to how it would be done now. The 19th century utopian socialist proposed a technique using social credit cards based on the recently invented Holroth punch cards. Your hours works that you worked would be printed on it and when you went to a store, they would be cancelled out with a card punch. So when you received goods, the hours that you had worked would be knocked out and cancelled just the way a train ticket is cancelled. Except by having a Holroth card, you have enough holes to deal with all your hours' work done during the month. Uh, this is the original version of uh, looking backward. The utopian socialist novel 
by Bellamy, where he was imagining America in 1987 and the technologies it would then have. He assumed that there would be horn of plenty or cornucopia palaces where citizens would shop using these cards in 2000 AD. Goods would be delivered to people's houses using pneumatic tubes. So you would go there, you would um, choose your goods, you would have them cancelled out on your labour credit cards and the goods would then be popped into these pneumatic tubes and would arrive at your house. Basically, it's interesting to see that a utopian socialist invented the idea of the credit card. Uh, his horn of plenty palaces, which he described, were like modern shopping malls. And his tube delivery system foreshadows Amazon. Now, of course, the whole thing would be electronic. You'd use smart cards to make your payments. The Labour Ministry would keep time accounts accessed by these cards and software would prevent private transfers between accounts. So you'd get no circulation, no black markets. Whether we would actually build the pneumatic tubes is an interesting question. They sound a nice way of delivering things.